Welcome to another session uh, in the grammatical theory lecture. Today we will be dealing with head driven phrase structure grammar. Um, this is where we are in the course. So we already introduced basic terms and give a general motivation of syntax. We had a look at phrase structure grammars, like simple rewrite grammars and XBAR theory. This part actually had a, a bit of the motivation uh, of what we are doing now because there we introduced features into uh, phrase structure grammars and HPSG is basically an extreme version of that uh, with a lot of features um, and they are structured in a more um, sensible way so features are grouped in, in bundles. Um, we had a look at government and binding. Uh, transformational grammar is the root of um, almost all of the theories uh, we are looking at uh, right now. And um, a lot of concepts that we are building on were introduced in the three sessions here. Then we had a look at generalized phrase structure grammar, a non-transformational uh, theory that also is um, like the father or mother of heterogeneous phrase structure grammar. Um, we had a look at feature description, feature structures and models. That's the formal underpinnings we need for heterogeneous phrase structure grammar. And uh, we had a look at two other theories, uh, lexical functional grammar and categorical grammar. Today, heterogeneous phrase structure grammar. Um, the reading material is chapter nine uh, of the grammatical grammar theory textbook. Um, in the other sessions, I told you not to read the sections about semantics. Um, the semantics section is very brief in the HPC uh, chapter. It's basically about linking um, syntactic argument descriptions to the semantic representation. And um, it th this will reappear in the um, in the main text of the other sections so you will I think you will have to read it because uh, otherwise the, the semantics bits and pieces in the uh, other sections do not make any sense to you. Um, HPSG always has um, a, a pairing between syntax and semantics so most papers have some rudimentary form of semantics in them uh, which I think is important because after all, um, there's no point in just doing syntax if there is no way to connect uh, the, the theory to a theory of semantics because what syntax is about is connecting form to meaning. Okay, so um, what about HPSG, heterogeneous phrase, phrase structure grammar? It was developed by Karl Pollard and Ivan Sack in the mid 80s in Stanford. And um, so Ivan Sack was working there as a professor, Karl Pollard was uh, a PhD student, and he was also working at the Hewlett Packard Research Labs, um, which were um, located or which are located uh, in Palo Alto. And there was a, a group working with grammars and um, Karl Pollard over the summer changed the grammar into something that was more similar to categorical grammar and um, together the, the group there in Stanford developed HPSG. Um, the, the main publications are Pollard, Sark, 87 and 94. Um, there are further books by Ivan Sark, um, which uh, ten, developed into the uh, sign-based construction grammar uh, direction. Um, so I don't list them here, but uh, sign-based construction grammar is also a variant of HPC, as uh, Ivan Sark says so in, in a paper by him on extraction from 2010. Um, 
Yeah, if, if you want to know everything, or almost everything, about the history of uh, uh, HPC, there is a um, forthcoming handbook on HPC that has a chapter on the history of HPC. Uh, and there are things, there are things in it I didn't know before I read the chapter. So it's an interesting read. And uh, if you're interested in the history, you can go there and uh, read that chapter. Um, HPSG is part of West Coast linguistics. I al already explained the term in the LFG um, uh, session. So uh, there is uh, Ivan Sack and John Bresnan were professors in Stanford at Stanford University. Um, there's also the Berkeley construction uh, grammar branch uh, also located at the West Coast. And these kind of, or types of theories or frameworks are as far away from um, uh, Chomsky and linguistic as linguistics as one could get. And this distance is also there uh, physically, right? So they are at the West Coast, Chomsky, MIT is at the East Coast. And the both, both of, um, in the LFG and HPG um, uh, leading figures, Ivan Sark and John Bresnan, uh, are former former Chomsky uh, uh, PhD students, and then went their own ways uh, to the West Coast. Um, the hotspots of HPG, I don't know whether one can use that word in, in Corona times, it sounds strange, but um, uh, the hotspots are nowadays uh, Columbus, Ohio, uh, Buffalo. There, there's a strong research community in Germany doing HPC. Um, there are people in Paris uh, also having a connection, Paris, Frankfurt, um, and, and joint projects and so on. There uh, is uh, HPC in Asia, so Seoul is one uh one of the uh, places in korea where it's done um there are several textbooks and uh, overview articles um i have a textbook that's available uh for open access uh, it's in german uh, but there are also um uh, overview articles that you may read. There is an interesting article. I shouldn't say that because it's written by me, but there's an article um, um, in a BA textbook that introduces various frameworks. And it's um, the, the book as such is interesting because the, there was some uh, computational linguists that uh, call it a shared task. So there was a little piece uh, of text from from a newspaper uh, and uh, it was supposed to be analyzed by all the uh, contributors to the volume so you have something of the kind that I tried to do with the grammar theory textbook but it's uh, written by various authors um, so this is uh, the the 2014 volume if you go to my web page you can click on the, uh, the example sentences and see uh, the analyses uh, that were produced by a computational system so it's implemented the analysis so it, th that means that it's internally consistent and uh, really works it doesn't mean that it is right the best linguistic analysis but at least it's one consistent uh, analysis and that's um, something not all theories can claim about themselves. Um, the, a similar overview article is uh, Müller and Machikao i Primär. It's also um, in, in a similar type of handbook uh, where Mary Dahlrumpel working in LFG had the, made the suggestion to take a common sentence and analyze this. And uh, again, you can comp uh, compare uh, various series and see how they deal with that sentence and 
again, the analysis is online on, on my webpage, the HPC analysis, if you want to have a look. Um, yeah, the best resource on HPC is probably the handbook that is in the making. So we have almost all papers uh, in a pre-final stage now. They are available on the web page if you want to have a look. And uh, I hope that it will be published by Language Science Press uh, next year so that we really finish it next year. Um, so it has uh, 36 or 35 chapters on various topics, uh, historical, as you know, and uh, then syntactic phenomena and also other areas of uh, linguistics, psycholinguistics and so on. So it should answer every question you have. If something is missing, tell me, then we will put it in the uh, second edition, maybe, I hope. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, yeah for for the history and as as a bit of background, Ivan Sark was one of the developers of GPSG. So many ideas, uh, uh, I would say the the good ones uh, were taken over uh, to HPSG. So it's no surprise that we have um, the slash based analysis of non-local dependencies and also linearization constraints as we had in GPSG. Okay, so this will be uh, the outline, or that is the outline of the uh, course, uh, the session. Um, as usual, I will give you some general remarks on uh, the representational format, and then I will talk about the uh, phenomena in, uh, in German, um, passive verb position, local reordering, uh, also known as scrambling, long distance dependencies, and then I sum up. So what is HPSG? It's lexicalized, head-driven, as the name says. Uh, it's sign-based um, in, in the sense of uh, saussure, um, so for meaning pairs together with uh, syntactic information. Um, it's using type feature structures to model linguistic objects and everything is done with typed feature structures. So there's no phrase structure grammar like in um, an LFG, like a C structure, and then some F structure with feature structures, but it's everything that is done with um, feature structures. There are uh, formalizations of uh, LFG that also just use feature structures for everything. Um, that's a uh, a way to, to do that if you want to have a model theoretic uh, understanding of grammar. Um, so that's, but, but in HPG, it's uh, what you find in the papers, right? So there is no phrase structure component in the papers. Some computer implementations have them, but um, they are not crucial for the theory. Um, Okay, then we have multiple inheritance. So we have types and type hierarchies and there's multiple inheritance. That's important because um, that's something that cognitive linguists argue that is real, that, that humans use uh, such uh, hierarchies for capturing generalizations uh, in various parts of cognition and uh, HPHD has that as well. It had it from the very beginning, from 85 on. And it's a monostratal theory, so every kind of uh, information is represented in one structure. So for instance, uh, we have phonology here, so that is grammatic, grammar. Uh, we have syntactic information here. Um, we have here information about the, the part of speech, that it's a noun. We have information about um, dependence, so the noun wants to have a determiner. And we have this little box here saying that the information is identical, so the noun agrees with the determiner in case. And we have semantics, so that means the, the meaning of grammatic is grammatic. Um, that's a kind of semantics. 
um, Lakoff uh, made fun of when he said the um, meaning of life is life prime. So that's uh, what you see here, right? The meaning of karmatic is karmatic. Um, the, the point here is that all that information is uh, in one structure. Um, all things here can see each other, talk to each other, are accessible simultaneously. There's no ordering of um, uh, of levels like in the T model uh, in GB we, we, had, we looked at and then even um, more complex um, models uh, in minimalism. So it's one chunk and um, you can say where the the syntax interacts with semantics and where the phonology interacts with syntax and um, if if you want if you believe in modules right uh, like like um, separate parts of grammar uh, then you can have that so then then everything under cat would be the syntactic module and everything under cont would be the uh, semantics module and everything under phonology would be the phonology model module right so Jackendorf uh, talks about these things uh, and says well there are these models but they they talk to each other and they talk to each other all the time so that's an important thing that's what psycholinguistics tells us uh, that we can access this information as soon as we have it if you hear utterances uh, spoken language uh, as a hearer you immediately start to use all information you have. Uh, so there are eye, eye tracking experiments showing that people in the middle of words, they, they, uh, the, the eye, the, the gaze goes uh, to uh, um, an object in the scene uh, as soon as they can identify um, which word uh, was spoken. So it's in the middle of the word and uh, we also build some tactic structure as we go along um, using clues from semantics and that is com completely incompatible with uh, transformational views if they would assume that this is psycholinguistically real, right? So that they say, okay, we build some structure bottom up and then we move something around. And then uh, once we are done, we send it to semantics or once we have built a face, we send it to semantics. All of that doesn't work. And I don't know why one should assume that because it's not reconcilable with psycholinguistic facts, uh, but still people do it. and. May, yeah, they can do what they want, but then in the end, they have to come up with series connecting what they do with psycholinguistic facts. That's really difficult, I think. If you uh, don't make any claims about order of processing and, and stuff like that, then you don't have the problem. And that's what HPSG does. It doesn't say anything about order. And uh, that's basically what we started with, right? If you remember the introduction, we had the competence performance distinction and uh, HPC doesn't say anything about performance, uh, how you use that knowledge, but it's compatible with a proper uh, series of, um, of psycholinguistically uh, motivated series of processing. Okay, so what are the influences? Um, well, uh, one more thing. If you want to learn more about these psycholinguistic uh, uh, issues and, and ideas and with respect to HPSG, you can go to the uh, HPSG handbook. There is a chapter by Tom Wasso in it, uh, dealing with all the issues and explaining and, and uh, giving pointers to psycholinguistic literature and so on. Okay, so what are the influences uh, of uh, HPSG? We already mentioned some um, categorical grammar. So Carl Pollard was a categorical grammarian. Uh, he did his PhD in, in some categorical grammar framework. Um, so functor argument structures are taken from there valence uh, uh, representation, argument composition. So that's something you need for German verbal complexes um, uh, where you have more than one verb uh, that, that form a, a certain unit um, with other verbs and take the arguments uh, together as if they were a simplex verb. 
So that's taken from categorical grammar. Um, uh, GPSG, a lot of stuff was taken over from GPSG. So the IDLP format, the slash mechanism for non-local dependencies was also taken over. And it basically, it, it was the same gang, right? So they, they all worked on, on GPSG, Jean Nerbonne, uh, Bob Levine, and so on. And then at a certain point, it was clear, okay, it's not complex. Uh, enough in, in terms of uh, computational complexity. So GPHG was dead and everybody who was working in GPHG either stopped working on syntax uh, like or did non-formal syntax um, uh, like Jeff Pullum who did uh, other things more philosophical stuff or descriptive work or they continued with uh, HPHG. Then uh, government and binding, although a lot of people really don't like government and binding, there is uh, some influence um, of uh, uh, this framework, um, maybe especially in the German uh, HPC branch, because um, a lot of people assume this uh, the verb position analysis uh, for German uh, that treats German as an, as an SOV language and then um, the verb is fronted in questions or uh, declarative main clauses. I also assume that uh, analysis, I argue for it in a forthcoming, hopefully forthcoming book uh, about German clause structure and um, uh, in, in two articles that were published a while ago in German. And before I published these German articles, I had a different analysis. So that was not government and binding uh, inspired. But then I looked at a certain range of data, uh, so-called multiple frontings, where you have verbs third or verb fourth. Uh, sentences in German and they shouldn't exist because German is a verb second language. And if you look at this uh, long enough, you realize that there is no way around uh, to no alternative to assume that GB type of verb movement analysis. Of course, we don't have movement in, in HPC, but something equivalent to that. Um, okay, so, so I, I can assure you that I didn't switch, uh, didn't do that switch uh, uh, lightheartedly. I had an implemented uh, computer processable system, worked with this for 10 years, and uh, it's not that you throw away your theory overnight because you find something more attractive, so it was careful consideration, and I think there is no other way uh, of doing it, and I still think so after how many years? 2000. Five, damn, yeah, 15, 15 or 18 years, something like that. Okay, so, and there is a construction grammar um, that also influenced HPSG. Um, Ivan Sark teamed up with uh, Berkeley construction grammar. So, in the Bay Area, there were uh, people working together. Um, Film OK were there and worked together with uh, Ivan Sark and Tom Vasso uh, and others from, from Stanford and uh, Hans Boas also uh, from Texas. And um, the, the influence that was there was that um, certain phrasal aspects got more emphasis in later publications. So as I said, in 85, we already had uh, inheritance hierarchies uh, in, in HPSG. So that was um, an ACL paper, 85, and then 87, Dan Flickinger's dissertation. And um, then in, um, in the 90s, construction grammar became more and more influential with the work of Adele Goldberg and uh, Mike Tomasello and of course, uh, uh, film OK. And so the certain phrasal aspects were uh, also modeled in HPSG, uh, beginning with, I would say, Ivan Sark's paper on relative clauses, um, but still HPSG uh, stayed 
remain to be a lexical framework, but in some uh, parts of the grammar, um, these um, phrasal aspects are important um, and have been used in, in HPG as well. Okay. Um, this is where we started uh, with phrase structure rules. Um, also, GPSG had rules like that, right? So they, we had uh, a large number of rules that corresponded to valence patterns. Um, so that that uh, these are examples. So an S can consist of an NP and a verb, an NP and an NP and a verb. And here you see examples for that, right? So um, X sleeps, X Y loves, X about Y talks, X Y that gives, uh, X Y with that serves, right? Um, so for all these verbs, uh, GPSG has special rule uh, rules or ID rules. And um, this is something I also criticized when we talked about um, GPSG. So there were problems with, um, um, with partial verb phrase fronting, uh, because then you can have partial realizations of this that basically breaks this pattern, right? This is also a problem with uh, phrasal construction grammar. Um, and there are problems with morphology where you have to have uh, a lexical representation of, uh, uh, of valence. And if you have the valence just here in this rule, then you, cannot access it in the morphological component where you need it to uh, do a proper analysis, let's say of bar derivation. By the way, this is also in the uh, book, in the introduction of the book on sign-based construction grammar. So um, Hans Boas, Ivan Sarg and Paul Kay agree that um, that's an argument for, for a lexical treatment of a phenomenon. I'm sorry, I'm talking too much uh, stuff, <laughs> but I think it's uh, important uh, to get an overall picture. And it's for you, it's more interesting because it's not just a book and um, uh, you get a bigger picture. Okay. Um, anyway, so, so, so this is what we had in uh, GPSG and what we need to, to use that is some way to relate the lexical items to these uh, phrasal patterns, right? So uh, we have to have some feature or something so that only the appropriate verb goes in here. In, in GPSG, it was a number, right? But we could call it intransitive verb or something, right? So we have a feature for the valence class. Um, this means that we have the information about the what kind of arguments are realized in the phrase structure grammar, and we have it in the um, in the representation of the lexical items. So we have it two times. GPS uh, construction grammar sometimes says it, we only have semantics there in the lexical items, and then it enters some constructions. But I don't see how that works in 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 a general fashion. Um, Okay, so what um, HPSG does is that they assume that um, arguments are complex. So they are descriptions of things that uh, need to be combined with a head. Uh, and that's like category grammar. So it's um, um, like we, we talked in, in the in a session on feature uh, structures and feature descriptions, we talked about uh, persons, right, uh, people, um, and we can do that here as well, right? So a hat has a description of, uh, so, so you can imagine that as a person looking for somebody else, so uh, the person has descriptions of ideal partners to uh, combine with. And these descriptions are underspecified in, in various ways. So um, if you look for, for a partner, you have certain constraints. Uh, like uh, the color of the hair or the uh, size uh, in meters or something like that. Um, and other things don't matter. 
and uh, so the the question is whether the the person you meet uh, fits this description and if uh, it has other properties then there is no problem um, and you will be a happy couple right and so it's it's similar in hpg a head has a description of uh, uh, possible arguments and um, it doesn't say I want to combine with a pronoun or with a full NP, but it just says I want to combine with something nominal and it has to have a certain case. Um, so here are some examples. Um, you see we have just lists here and uh, this is schlafen, it takes an NP and a nominative, erwarten, NP nominative, accusative, sprechen, nominative and a PP uh, about and um, geben, nominative, dative, accusative, dean, nominative, dative, and a prepositional uh, phrase with a certain preposition. Um, this is how that uh, such lexical items can be used. Mm. Here we have Peter sleeps. And uh, Peter selects uh, an NP in the nominative. And what you see in this little tree here is that um, the description in this list, it's called comps for complements, uh, is identified with the sister here in the tree. So we have a description here. It's, this is partial at, the, uh, at this place. Um, Peter, um, of course, has certain properties. So it's a proper name, it's uh, syntactically complete, it's, uh, and so on. And this um, thing here is more specific than what we are looking for, but it has to be compatible with what we are looking for. So it's identified, right? So that's basically the test, whether it's the right kind of Peter. Um, Another thing to note about this tree is that this villains list gets shorter. So once we have found the Peter, um, we don't need anything anymore. And this is a list of things that are needed and it's the empty list. So that's a complete verbal projection, right? So um, you, you can use abbreviations for that. So it's like a sentence or, or a VP, right? if you want to emphasize the head uh, status that both of these things are verbs. Um, yeah, maybe I should say it here, right? So all of this is just, these are just abbreviations. Also the trees do not exist. It's all feature value pairs. We will talk about the trees uh, in a minute, how to represent them in feature value pairs. But this is all, um, uh, feature and value pairs, and that's just an abbreviation to make these structures more uh, readable. So here you see an example with a transitive verb, Peter Maria erwartet. So that's all verb final sentences because um, we will talk about verb initial sentences later. They are more complex, right? So here you have um, two elements in the comps list. You have the accusative. Uh, <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. So let's do it at Wood style. We just continue the presentation. No cutting. Um, okay, so, so you have two arguments in the comps list and uh, you combine the head with the uh, last argument. What you then need uh, is just the one. So here you need one and two. Just the one is left and you combine it uh, with the nominative NP, and then you get something that is complete, right? So no magic involved here. Um, now let's have a look at the difference between English and German. Um, the, I, what I showed you uh, so far were complements lists containing subject and objects. 
Um, if you know the terminology, you may find that strange because subjects are usually not complements, so they are separate from complements. But uh, some or well, many researchers argued um, for German that there is no structural difference between subjects and uh, objects, so that they should be treated uh, alike, at least for finite verbs. And that's what uh, Karl Poller suggested for, uh, for, HPG, for an HPG analysis uh, of German. So that's actually, uh, that was done in 1990, but sometimes, uh, book projects take some time, so it was published six years later. Um, and what is interesting is that uh, Peter Eisenberg made a similar suggestion, and he's in a totally different framework, right? So he uh, is doing integrational uh, linguistics, but he has very good descriptive books on German. It's a standard book. If, if you deal with German grammar, you have to have one of the 20 editions of uh, Eisenberg's uh, grammar books. And he suggests that the subjects in German are um, basically like, like the other arguments. Um, Okay, and, and this is also, by the way, if you, if you think about G, in, in GB terms, uh, the question whether you have an IP where the subject is different or everything in the VP. So basically what, what HPG says is that the subject of finite verbs is like the complements and it was, is within the VP. It depends on the verb and uh, can be realized among the other arguments of the verb. So now the the if you look at English, then you say you see that the subject is different. So people say there are uh, extraction island things and uh, special syntactic effects um, and so on. And this is, all doesn't hold for for German, right? As Hubert Haider also showed in his work. Um, so what? people do in HPSG is that they assume um, uh, an underlying representation um, containing all arguments. That's the so-called argument structure list. There's also a handbook uh, article, uh, a handbook chapter on argument structure and uh, what is called linking. So the connection between syntax and semantics that is done on this argument structure list. This list contains um, uh, syntactic and semantic descriptions of uh, arguments overhead. And then there are language specific mapping principles that map the elements of the argument structure to uh, valence features. So in German, as I just said, everything on the ArcST list would be mapped to comps for finite verbs. And for English, we would uh, assume that the subject, which is the first element of the ArcST list, so the nominative element, is mapped to the specifier feature, and <coughs> all the other elements are mapped to comps. So this is what you get here, right? Um, sleep has a subject, a specifier, expect has a subject, and an accusative object, and so on. And um, the the point is that the subject is also um, structurally different uh, from from complements. So complements go to the right, and uh, the specifiers go to the left. And therefore, the uh, the structures are parallel to NP structures that are also assumed to have a specifier, and uh, the the specifier is a determiner in the NP and then nouns can have complements that go to the right. So that's parallel. This was one of the reasons um, for the IP analysis uh, in GB to have this parallelism uh, 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 in the clausal and the uh, nominal domain. Um, it's the, the parallelism is here in HPSG, is captured in HPSG as well but uh, without a DP analysis and without uh, an IP for auxiliaries. 
Okay, so this is it. Um, SVO uh, is done that way and um, SOV, as we will see, is just um, with everything on comps. This is uh, an example analysis um, of an English sentence. Kim talks about the summer. Um, here we have uh, an NP analysis. The determiner depends on the noun. It's selected via specifier. Um, again, here's a structure sharing between the element in a specifier list and the element realized here. What we get is a nominal projection with nothing in specifier and nothing in comps. So that's an NP. This NP uh, is selected by the prepositional phrase, which doesn't select a specifier, but just a complement. Um, uh, the result is something that ha doesn't have anything in specifier and uh, doesn't have anything in comps either. This PP is the argument of talks. Um, the talks also has a specifier that's uh, still selected at that point and it's identified with Kim and we get uh, a fully saturated verbal projection with which is our finite clause, right? So we are done. Um, the next thing we want to look at is the representation of constituent structure. Um, this is a tree of the kind we saw so far. Uh, dem man, the man, and the this tree can be uh, formalized with uh, feature descriptions, uh, and that is shown in two hundred thirteen. Um, what is interesting about HPSG is that there is a phonology feature at, at in every structure, right? So. Uh, you have uh, the phonology of the whole thing here, uh, which is de man, and you have phonologies of the daughters, which is this stuff, dem and man. And um, this is different from other series. Um, in LFG, you just have the C structure and you have leaves at the bottom of, uh, of a tree, so to say, and uh, you have to take care about uh, to, to take care of the order of these leaves. But in HPSG, you have phonology at every node. So in principle, you could add uh, some information here. If you have a, like a crazy theory, you could add case information here at, at, in the middle of the tree. But nobody does that, right? Because that, that would violate lexical integrity, uh, which was also assumed in um, HPSG. We learned about that in the LFG session. Okay, um, so what is this? The, if you basically take that tree you see here and turn it to the left, um, then, then you get something like this structure, right? So you have the head daughter here, that's a noun uh, with a phonology man, and you have the non head daughters, uh, which is deem with a phonology deem. And then you have the phonology of the whole thing, uh, which is dem man. It's a concatenation of uh, the phonology of the non-head daughters and the head daughter in this case. Um, what else do we have to say? That is a list. Um, there could be also structures without a head daughter, um, where we only have stuff in the non-head daughters. So for instance, for relative clauses, um, that would, be what we get then, right? But I hope the idea is clear uh, how to represent trees here in uh, feature descriptions. Um, what you see here, I, I will go on quickly and you will not see anything like that again. Uh, it, what you see here is a very complex structure. It's um, the f fully specified structure that is assumed for for a word like grammatic um, and the the point is or the reason why i want to show this to you is that 
um, I want to show you the, the nesting here and uh, say why it's there. So what we do in HPSG is we only have these structures, right? And uh, they, they are grouped in a certain way to enable structure sharing. So if we want to say this head information is needed somewhere else, then we can access everything that is here on the head. Or if we want to say the, this uh, syntactic information is needed for something. For instance, for coordination, right? So you have symmetric coordination where you have two conjuncts that have to have the same syntactic uh, properties. So you can just refer to this part of the structure. Therefore, we have this uh, grouping of information, right? So there are formal variants of, of construction grammar like uh, fluid construction grammar where Rimi van Trieb says, oh no, we don't need that structure. But if you don't have it, you have to select individual features and uh, make them uh, identical, right? And say something about their identity. So we can just refer to these chunks of information. This is information that is relevant locally. This is information for the slash uh, stuff that you learned about in the GPSG uh, uh, section. Um, SYNSAM contains syntactic and semantic information and is needed for selection of arguments. We will not go into that any further. If you're really interested in, in HPSG, you should study one of the books um, uh, or the handbook then once it appears uh, or one of the overview articles. So if you, if you, studying with me at the Humboldt University, there will be an HPSG lecture next semester where you get the full story. Um, okay. We, I, 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 needed to, I needed this slide to make that um, stuff here understandable. In the HPSG handbook, we just used abbreviations instead. I, don't like it because it's not fully explicit. So I rather give you the, the fully explicit formalization and you know what that is. These are the, the feature groups and bundles that we need for other things, right? So with the representation of trees you just uh, learned about and the feature geometry you learned about, we are not now ready to have a look at um, phrase structure rules or the, the immediate dominance schemata that are used instead of phrase structure rules. And that is um, something that is uh, given here. So it says a head complement phrase is something that consists of a head daughter and uh, a non-head daughter, right? So the list of non-head daughters contains one element. And the last element of the comps list of the head daughter is identified with the synsum value of the non-head daughters. This little thing here means append and it just connects two lists. So um, this list is a list containing one element and this element is identified with a non-head daughter. This element, we don't know how many elements it contains, is just passed up to the mother node. So this is the uh, description of the, the complex object we have um, as, the, as the mother. And it says that the syndrome local cat comps value is one. So one can be the empty list or it can, contain, can be a list with one element or with two elements or whatever. It's just important that um, uh, this one element list matches, uh, the element in there matches this uh, non-head daughter and the rest of the comps list is passed on. So that would be a, a structure licensed by the theory. So for Peter Sleeps, uh, we get the structure. So we have Peter here syntax and semantics are identified with the nominative and p-nominative requirement of Schläft. 
that's the head daughter, and the comms list of the whole thing is the empty list, right? Because we take off that element, right? It's realized at this one, as this one, and there's nothing left in the list, and uh, we are done. Um, yeah, maybe it would be for didactic reason, it would be better to have a two here, right? So that's a, the thing we have here. So if there is two and we call that one, then it's more parallel. But these, these numbers don't mean anything outside of the feature structure, right? So they are always local to, or to the feature descriptions uh, or feature structures they are used in. Okay, then we have linearization rules. Um, um, the rule in A says heads with an initial feature plus uh, precede their complement, and the B case says the complement uh, precedes heads with the initial value minus. The, these rules are needed for, uh, for example, for prepositional phrases. Like if you have in den Schrank or in, in the cupboard, the preposition has to precede the NP. So it has the initial value plus, and uh, this rules out den Schrank in. So that's a wrong order, obviously. And verbs in German have uh, the initial value minus, dass er ihn umfüllt, it's okay, so it has to be final, but uh, um, we also have to make sure that we don't admit dass er umfüllt ihn. So here the verb would be uh, serialized to the left of um, the accusative object that is not okay. So uh, this kind of um, uh, uh, linearization rule rules out that order. Um, okay. Mm. There, there are certain cases, um, and that's interesting. Um, I should turn should have turned that into a slide. There are certain cases uh, in in the grammars where we can underspecify order. So for instance, adjuncts, uh, certain adverbs in English can appear before the VP or after the VP. And if we don't constrain their occurrence, then, so the grammar doesn't say anything about that, uh, both orders are licensed by the grammar. So that's really different from what phrase structure grammars do. So in phrase structure grammars, uh, you have to explicitly uh, mention in which order things uh, can appear, and um, they have to be that, that has to be specified in the grammar. And if you don't, then nothing will be generated. So here we have some some form of underspecification, and that's an interesting uh, property of uh, HPSG and constraint-based grammars in general. Okay, one more basic thing we have to talk about, uh, that's head features. So there are certain properties of elements that have, that are rooted in lexical items and that have to be available at, at uh, the top node of a projection. Um, an example is the verb form. If you look at the examples here in 219, um, we see that the auxiliary selects the form of the verb, right? So we have dem Mann helfen will er nicht, dem Mann geholfen hat er nicht. So hat selects a perfect participle and wollen once uh, uh, selects a bare infinitive, an infinitive without zu. Um, if you look at C and D, you see it's ungrammatical. So you cannot swap these um, verb phrases. Dem Mann geholfen will er nicht, dem Mann helfen hat er nicht, uh, impossible. So that means that this 
this verb here somehow has to see the form of that thing. And if you don't want to want if you don't want heads to be able to dig around in, in trees in complicated structures um, and you don't want that because it's difficult to to describe where they can look and where not right because there could be a relative clause with some other verb in there and you have to make sure that the verb doesn't go too far and it finds the right verb so one way to do that is that you say okay the information about that stuff um, what is in here the important stuff is passed up so remember the the very introductory session uh, where i said okay we have this this box model of german clauses uh, and we just label the boxes and write down uh, information about the important elements in there so we said um, we have a determiner and a noun and we said something about the case of the determiner and the noun and then we had something about the case of the np right and that's what we are doing here with um, uh, the the form of the verb so that's a, a, a property of the whole verb phrase then in the end and uh, in order to do that, also the, the, the case stuff in the NP, uh, we have to have some mechanism that passes this information along. So this is a, a, a visualization of, of a analysis and what we want to get passed on, right? So we have our, our uh, example sentence, dass er dem Mann das Buch gibt, and we have a, a gibt, here uh, as a lexical item and the the does um, the the complementizer that combines with this clause uh, wants to have a finite clause so we cannot have das er dem kind das buch uh, geben or zugeben or whatever that doesn't work so it has to be a finite clause and it has to be a clause it cannot be a prepositional phrase or something so it there has to be a verb in there and it has to be finite. So this information is here at the lexical item and we have to pass it up. And this is indicated by these arrows here. And um, that's a nice picture. Sometimes you find things like that in, in uh, publications, but it's not enough. So you have to be explicit about that. So there has to be some formalization. And that's what, um, uh, is done in HPG by uh, structure sharing. So we have um, the information about the, the part of speech, so it's a verb, and we have information about the verb form in the lexical entry of gibt, and this information is structure shared in the tree, right? So one, 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 one. And because of that structure sharing, we have this information of the lexical item at the topmost node. Um, we will continue to talk about this head feature uh, percolation, but before we do so, um, I want to mention another thing, namely types and type hierarchies. Uh, you already learned about types in the um, formal foundation session on type feature descriptions and type feature structures. This is a, a little bit more advanced uh, type hierarchies of phrasal types. Um, so we have the most general types for linguistic objects is a sign, remember Saussure, and there are two subtypes, words and phrases. There, there will be in a re real, realistic hierarchy, there will be much more types, right? Uh, and phrases are divided in non-headed phrases and headed phrases and um, there are head adjunct phrases, head filler phrases and so on. We just look at head complement phrases. That, that's in, in our uh, toy hierarchy, it's the only subtype of headed phrases. Um, yeah, in, in HPSG, if you have this model theoretic uh, point of view, all feature structures are typed. So uh, a linguistic object has to have types in all these uh, feature descriptions that you give, the, uh, feature structures that, that are in the model. You don't have to provide them in the uh, description. 
sometimes they follow from from the general setup but in the uh, in the model they have to be there the types are ordered in hierarchies that's what we see here in this example and the important thing is that subtypes inherit constraints from super types so this uh, type here head complement phrase has all the properties that head headed phrases have and this is our uh, head free term principle the constraint that um, says whatever the value of head of the head daughter is head daughter sunsam local card head uh, is identical to sunsam log card head of the mother so this gives us uh, what i showed you in the on the previous slide uh, where the head information of the finite verb is passed on to the top node in the sentence in the clause um, I, I want to show you this inheritance aspect of, of the hierarchy. Again, if you look at head complement phrases, right, the structures of type head complement phrase, you see something like this complex structure. So I will fill in more details. But what you see here now, right now, is uh, what I stated earlier for head complement phrases, right? So we said, okay, there is a synsum uh, object in the comps list, and it's identified with uh, the element in the non-head daughters list, and the remainder of the list is passed on to the mother. Now, if you uh, take in addition the information that comes from the head. Uh, head feature principle for, from the constraints on headed phrase, you get this, right? So you have the uh, identification of the head values uh, in addition, and this is coming from, from a super type, right? Of head complement phrase. Okay. Um, yeah, so inheritance hierarchies are important for capturing generalization. The head uh, the constraints on headed uh, phrase are not just valid for head complements phrases, but also for head adjunct phrases, head filler phrases, and so on, right? So you state them once and uh, they apply to all kinds of uh, schemata. This is something that is not possible in, in these phrase structure grammars um, and, and simple phrase structure grammars we talked about, right? Okay, so that was the basic machinery. Uh, I hope it was understandable. It, it was a very brief introduction. As I said, there's more in, in the HPG textbook. And um, if you're studying next semester, uh, we can talk about that in more detail. So the remainder of the session will be rather brief compared to, to what we had until now. Um, it's our standard phenomena. Uh, let's look at the passive first. Um, HPSG follows resonance argumentation that passive should be treated lexically. So we also assume lexical integrity. And uh, then a lexical rule is assumed that takes a verbal stem as input and licenses a participle form. Um, the lexical rule just uh, takes the most prominent argument, the designated argument, and suppresses it. Um, this is what we want, right? Um, as I said in the GB lecture, um, passive doesn't have anything to do with movement. It's about suppressing the most prominent argument. And in German, you have impersonal passives and uh, so-called personal passives um, that can be done uh, with the same passive lexical rule. And I will show you why, uh, how in, in a minute. Okay, um, since grammatical functions are not part of the theory in uh, comparison to LFG, um, where grammatical functions played a role, um, and since HPC doesn't have that, we don't need mapping principles to uh, map objects onto sub subjects. Um, so that's not a problem. 
but we have to somehow account for the change of case impassives. So that has to be explained. So why is something that uh, is an accusative and uh, active uh, realized as a nominative in the passive? Okay, so uh, for that we use the distinction between structural and lexical case. Again, to remind you, I mean, we, we dealt with that in the GB session. Um, structural case is case that changes uh, if depending on the syntactic environment and uh, if the change if the case stays constant then it's called lexical case so example of structural case are uh, the nominative of uh, intransitive verbs der installateur kommt so this is nominative in, in the active, but we can uh, turn it into accusative if we use it uh, in an ACI context, um, accusative with infinitive uh, context with these uh, causative verbs, right? So we have der Mann lässt den Installateur kommen. So the subject of kommen is now realized as an accusative, as an, in fact, an object of uh, lassen. And uh, in, nominal, in, in nominal context, we get an, a genitive, right? Das kommen des Installateurs. Now, um, uh, similarly, the object, the object, uh, accusative object of transitive verbs um, is, yeah accusative in the active. And if we passivize this uh, example, we get a nominative, der Weltmeister wird geschlagen. Judith schlägt den Weltmeister, der Weltmeister wird geschlagen. And um, again, in normalization environment, das Schlagen des Weltmeisters is nicht einfach or something uh, like that, we get a genitive. Okay, the, the, um, opposite of structural case is lexical case. Um, if you look at the examples in 224, we see that the case doesn't change. Um, we gedenken der Opfer. So we have a genitive case in uh, the active, depending on the verb and uh, the the passivization is B, that's a so-called impersonal passive, der Opfer wird gedacht. Um, and you see the, the NP stays in, in the genitive. Uh, we, can, uh, we don't have nominative. If it would be nominative, it would be die Opfer wird gedacht or werden gedacht. Um, that's different, right? So the correct passive form would be this and the case doesn't change. Um, I also assume, uh, yeah, so that's an impersonal passive. There is no subject in the B example. And I also assume that the dative is a lexical case. We talked about that in the GB session. And there is some uh, more detailed discussion of that in the HBG uh, textbook. And in the, that's in German. If you want to read about it in English, there is a, a Germanic, syntax textbook that also discusses uh, the, this lexical st structural case distinction. Okay, um, now um, we, what we will do is that we specify uh, the case in the lexical items as lexical case or structural case. And uh, since structural case is the case that depends on the syntactic uh, environment, we somehow have to relate the syntactic uh, environment to the, the case that is assigned to these items. And this is done by the case principle that is given here. And it says that the first element with structural case in the argument structure of a lexical item receives nominative, all other elements in the list with structural case um, in, in verbal environments uh, receive accusative and um, in nominal environments elements with structural case are assigned genitive. So the first two clauses uh, are 
stated for verbs, and uh, the second clause is for uh, the third clause is for nominal environment. So this um, the the idea of um, the structural lexical uh, distinction is based on on a very influential uh, article by Yip Marling and Jackendorf, and um, they did it for Icelandic and so on. And of course that case principle as you see it here also works for Icelandic and other Germanic languages and also for Hindi and Spanish and so on. So that is if you want to read about the Germanic languages you can read uh, in my Germanic syntax introduction. Okay um, now that, that was uh, up in the air and um, probably not so easy to grasp, but let's have a look at some examples. So this, the, these are some prototypical valence list for finite verbs. So we have sh uh, sleep, schlafen, unterstützen, helfen, and schenken. And that's just an intransitive verb. That's uh, basically a minimal pair between unterstützen and helfen. So they are not so far away uh, far apart from each other in terms of meaning, um, but one of them takes an accusative object and one takes a dative object. So this accusative uh, here has structural case and the other has dative, it's a lexical case. So it's lexically marked uh, to have dative. And then we have a ditransitive verb with uh, a first element structural case, the dative object and another structural case. So the case principle was, uh, uh, formulated uh, that we that we said okay the first element in that list gets uh, nominative so that would be these things and the second with structured case gets accusative so that's the second one so this means nominative dative accusative as we want it to be right for for the active case now um, the the, the reason why we did all that was passive. So let's have a look at the uh, passive analysis. What you see here is um, uh, our examples with little indices. So the, I put them there so that you can identify this, the, uh, the things when we look at the passive lexical items um, because we here just have structural and it doesn't say this is a nominative or something, right? And if you have two structural case and remove one, you don't know which one is which. So if we apply the passive uh, lexical rule, we just remove the first argument that there's something with a designated argument, but uh, we don't have to worry about the details. Uh, for the cases we look at, it's the first argument. And so this NPY with an index Y is uh, taken off from the list. And here for unterstützt, we have the NP still K. Here we have the dative K. Uh, and uh, Schenken give as a present, we have dative and uh, the structural case with L. So that's the second thing. And now the, the, uh, the argument structure list changed and we have a different first element with structural case. But this is the first NP with structural case. It used to be the accusative here. So here it was a second. And since it's the first now it gets nominative. Here for helfen, we have the dative, that doesn't change. It used to be the dative, it's a lexical case. So no, the case principle doesn't apply and it just stays dative. Uh, Geschenk, we have dative and this is the first thing now and uh, it gets nominative. So that's cool, right? So because uh, the, the argument structure is not affected, the order in there, and there is no movement. It's just there's just no problem the passive doesn't have anything to do with movement for english you can uh think about uh these things um help would be structural case because there is no dative in english uh give would be structural case structural case or let's see the second one would be lexical case and um 
then you can do a mapping uh, to to the specifier position right to the specifier valence feature and that would account for the fact that there has to be a subject in in english so it's not related to movement in any kind anyway okay the next part of the talk is um, about the verb position um, the insight that Tilman Höhle had in the 90s was that finite verbs and complementizers form a natural class. So he looked at German dialects and uh, also in English and said, okay, it's reasonable to, to say that this finite verb here, Kent, uh, has the same or some properties, some crucial properties that the complementizer here also has, right? So that they, it's, it makes sense to put them into a group of uh, entities. And if you look at um, the sentences and then on the analysis, I will suggest uh, you see that this uh, complementizer takes uh, 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 a verb final sentence with a verb in here and this um, verb initial sentence also takes uh, a finite sentence with a gap here right so the verb basically is missing here but it's just realized at this position and is combined with a finite clause and this does is also combined with a finite clause but the verb is in it um, Okay, I already explained that. So, so this is the visualization of the analysis. Um, I assume that there is a trace in verb final position. This is what you see here. Um, the, there is a special version of the verb in initial position that selects uh, the sentence, as I just explained, the sentence with a verb missing in the end. So. This is a normal verb that would select the nominative and the accusative, but it's um, um, mapped to uh, the special verb that selects this verbal projection. So um, there, this is done by a lexical rule that says, okay, if I have a verb that would look like this as it would appear in the verb final position um, then i also have another uh, verb that selects for a sentence <coughs> where this verb is missing and um, the connection between the gap in final position and the the verb in initial position is uh, established by percolation of information in the tree. So this verb basically says, okay, I'm missing um, a verb. So I'm a, I'm a trace, I pretend to be a verb, but I'm missing something, I miss a verb. And this information about the missing verb is uh, turned into a head feature and percolated up in the tree. Right? It's like all other head features, it's passed up. Because it's a head feature, it can only go as far as the projection goes. It cannot go any further. It's uh, in, in the area where this verb is the head. So it can go uh, up until here. And then there is this uh, funny verb here that behaves like a complementizer that selects a VP with a uh, verb missing, right? So because of that selection, we have the information about um, the missing verb here and identify it. And this information is also identified with the uh, verb here. And therefore, uh, and uh, I, uh, this, this is done by the lexical rule. The lexical rule identifies the input to the lexical rule um, with the verb that is selected or the, it, it says okay this input to the lexical rule is the verb that is missing from the vp that is selected so because of that we have the identification here this is identified with this and 
because it's a head feature, it's identified with this. And this is uh, identified with the verb that is here. And um, because of that, the information that is uh, present here is also present here. And this thing has a certain valence and because of the identification of the uh, whole information, the valence is also represented here. And this verbal trace can take an accusative and a nominative argument. So we have the whole structure and we also have the semantics because the semantics is also transferred from here to here. And remember the, the examples we discussed in the GB section um, about adjunct scope and so on. The semantics is available here and we can put negation or something in here that works very well. Okay, um, that was verb movement. So to say there is no movement, it's just sharing of information. Um, now we are talking about, we will talk about local reordering, scrambling. Um, to remind you, the phenomenon uh, is this. Um, so arguments in German can be uh, ordered in any order. So the example is a sentence with a ditransitive verb. We have six, uh, three arguments, and uh, the three arguments can be ordered in any order. So uh, for three arguments, there are six possible orders. And you see that here, it's, it's a little bit wide, but um, because of the color coding, you get some uh, impression what is possible in principle. Um, there are two options to uh, account for local reordering. The first option is to have flat structures like in GPSG. Um, the problem there is that you have to get the adjuncts uh, between the complements. There have been suggestions uh, to do that, uh, but it's not uh, simple. And I will do what most researchers working on German did, namely assume binary branching structures. And um, then there uh, have to be, you have to find ways to allow uh, an arbitrary order of combination of uh, elements. So this is uh, our examples. Um, we just look at the an example with a transitive verb, weil jeder diesen Mann kennt, uh, or weil diesen Mann jeder kennt. Um, the first uh, tree you see here is the one with a normal order. We have um, the nominative before the accusative in the valence list. And uh, we combine the verb with the last element in the list first. Then we are still missing the one that's a nominative, and then we are done. And the, the uh, marked order with accusative from before nominative um, is shown here. Uh, we just take the first element from the list and combine it with the verb. And uh, then we need the second one and uh, we have a full projection with the accusative preceding the nominative. Okay. Um, what uh, I, I showed you the head complement schema uh, before. And what we did there was that we had just one element uh, taken off or from the comms list. It was taken off from the last uh, position, so the last element was taken off. And now we are just permitting to take any element from any position of the comps list. This is formalized by using two occurrences of append. Um, so that's these little uh, plus symbols. And um, what, this, what this does is that we split the comps list of the head daughter into three parts. So there is a first part, then there is a list with one element, and then there is a second part. Um, we take this one element list, and this element is identified with the element in the non headquarters, and the initial part and the second part um, are then appended again, and these are the remaining uh, arguments that are listed at the mother node. Um, the 
interesting thing is if we, so that's a general uh, thing we assume for German, right? Because uh, the one and three can be of any length. We can take things from, from the beginning of the list or from the end of the list. It all depends on how the, the other things uh, uh, are, are split up. And then whatever we have in one and three is combined again at the mother node. Um, if we have things like English, um, we would just say, okay, we take the first thing from, from the list. So one would be the empty list. And then we just have something in three and um, put that up at the mother node. Uh, if we have a strict OV language, then three would be the empty list and we would take things from, from the end. And uh, for our case, uh, we, we take uh, arguments from wherever, right? So one and three are free. They could be empty or non-empty. So I sort of like this solution because it's, it, it reminds me of the parameters in uh, government and binding, right? Where you say, oh, if I do that, I get this language. If I do that, I get this language, so it's like that, right? So if, if it's a general schema, if you instantiate this with an empty list or this, then you get a certain type of language in the end. Okay, so almost done with HPSG. Um, the next thing we talk about is long distance dependencies. And the solution is not surprising, uh, given what I said so far. Um, HPSG inherited all the good things from GPSG, and there is uh, among the good things is the treatment of non-local dependencies. Um, one way is to assume an empty element. Um, not all uh, analysis of non-local dependencies assume empty elements, but uh, I do. So this is a version with an empty element. There's a trace in the normal position uh, in the tree. Um, there is passing on of the information in the tree. So it's passed on uh, from node to node. So it's a chain of local uh, dependencies. And then there's one final step where the slash element is identified with a filler and uh, that stops the passing on because we are done here. Uh, we don't want to percolate this information further because we have a filler. So that stops uh, the non-local dependency. Um, the, the constituent movement uh, is not local, so we could go cross clause uh, boundaries if uh, we want to, that's possible. Um, but the verb movement is local. So we have two different features. Uh, one is the slash feature that you saw here, so that can go on. And then we have the double slash feature, which is a head feature, and that would stop here. So you cannot go any further than this. Okay, um, this is it. Um, to sum up, Carpenter once called, in an interview, he called HPSG a Frankenstein theory, uh, since it was sued together from so many other theories, but I would call it a best of uh, theory. So we have uh, linearization rules from GPSG, the separation between immediate dominance and uh, linearization, linear precedence. We have valence from categorical grammar. We have verb placement, at least for German, uh, from government and binding. Uh, there are constructual patterns from uh, construction grammar. The notion of dependency that is prominent in dependency grammar is uh, also captured. So HPSG basically can do everything that uh, people want linguistic series to do, um, which is not the case for some of the other series. At least there's no obvious way uh, to see how, how uh, certain series can deal with uh, constructional uh, patterns where there is no head. Uh, I discussed this uh, in the uh, category grammar session. Okay, so 
this was HPSG. If you're interested uh, in HPSG, you can uh, take part in the HPSG lecture next, next semester. Um, it's optional in, or you, you can choose to take it in the uh, Berlin curriculum. Um, there's also an implementation course, grammar implementation, where we implement uh, little grammars uh, and uh, you work on, on various grammar sets with uh, um, exercise sheets to develop your own grammars. So then you really understand how the details of all that work. Okay, this is it. Um, there will be one more session for the grammatical theory course and then I will make some bonus uh, presentations if you're just <laughs> if you don't have enough yet uh, you can then have a look at minimalism and dependency grammar and so on okay so this is it for today thanks for watching till the end and um, let's meet again for the three adjoining grammar session in three minutes or next week or whenever you have time to watch it. Thank you very much.